The penultimate episode of the Bad Batch is here as we see Clone Force 99 attempt to infiltrate Tantus with the odds firmly stacked against them. We'll take our chances. Whilst Omega, on the other hand, continues to devise her breakout plan. I found something big. Episode 14 is an exciting and fast paced episode, a whirlwind from start to finish, however it doesn't leave me without any concerns. That being said, the battle's only just beginning. Before we jump in, leave a like on today's video if you enjoy it and subscribe to the channel if you'd like to catch more. Now I've all that out of the way, let's get into Flash Strike. We'll be exiting hyperspace soon. How's Echo gonna get off that ship? He'll find a way. We pick up with Clone Force 99 who are quite literally stuck on the side of a science vessel like barnacles on a starship. They're about to make a grand entrance out of hyperspace and arrive on Wayland. The tension's palpable as Crosshair, ever the voice of caution, is giving her to the lowdown on the jungle's lethality whilst Echo plays the young sung hero, keeping the ship's sensors as dead as a doornail. Meanwhile, back at Tantis, it's a regular Imperial mixer with commanders and engineers. Hemlock's at the center of it all. Scorch slides in with news of a potential security breach. It seems like Clone Force 99 has been playing hide and seek on the Imperial Station with Rampart. And now the whole place is locking down tighter than a Jawa's grip on a droid part. Orders are flying and Scorch is now the eye in the sky, keeping tabs on Tantus and the vessel. But lo and behold, the Batch's ship gets pinged and we're thrust into a Star Wars dogfight that will have you all gripping your seats. Scorch with a flick of a switch turns the laser cannons into a light show, tagging the shuttle and sending our heroes repelling into the jungle's embrace. Now we cut to the vault where the kids are feeling more than just a ground shake. Omega knows it's her brother stirring up the storm. Omega's got that sibling intuition going on. And let's not forget the narrative spice that's been simmering these past few episodes. Dr. Skolder, the sub-villain with a heart as cold as Hoth, who sees the kids as nothing more than lab rats. But here's the twist. Her presence is stirring the pot, creating tension and drawing a stark contrast to Emery, who's gone from rule-following superior pleasing protocol droid to someone with a heart thanks to Omega's influence. It's a tale of transformation from seeing kids as specimens to seeing them as, well, kids. And that, my friends, is character development with a capital C. The science vessel glides into port and Hemlock's barking orders like a drill sergeant at a boot camp for stormtroopers. Echo, ever the quick thinker, slips into standard stormtrooper gear. Meanwhile, Crosshair's having a heart-to-heart -heart with Wrecker. He never wanted to return to Tantis, but now he's got an IOU to Omega for saving his hide. The reunion with Hunter and Rampart is like mixing oil and water as they all head towards Tantis base. Rampart's playing mind games with Crosshair, the guy's got a PhD in messing with heads. He's whispering sweet nothings like, you can't change. Um, he might be right here, Crosshair's designed to be a sniper after all, a lone wolf. A one man show, but along came Omega, she saved his bacon, and now he's got loyalty tugging at his heartstrings, but loyalty to the Bad Batch, we'll have to wait and see there. Now down on the ground, Hemlock's got the Imperial Assault transports buzzing around. These are the same ships we saw at the Battle of Geonosis, back when Anakin was still a Jedi with his rat's house, Scorch and the gang going through the wreckage, but no bodies. It's like a cosmic game of hide and seek, and the stakes are higher than a hut's cholesterol levels. Echo, the master of undercover ops, is deep in the belly of the science vessel, masquerading as a run-of-the-mill TK trooper. It seems he's trying to pinpoint Omega's location, but I wouldn't be surprised if he's also trying to learn the coordinates to Tantis as well. But hold your blasters, because an RE7 protocol droid waltzes in like it's the Empire's Got Talent auditions. It hears Echo's clone voice coming from that TK armor and raises an eyebrow. You see, TK troopers are supposed to be human conscripts, not clones. The only clones still kicking around are the commandos with their snazzy glowing visors. But Echo's got a trick up his sleeve, or rather his blaster. He uses it to cleverly hide his missing hand until he pulls off the ultimate heist, shooting a droid and snagging his hand. Exit strategy? through the droid port, just like he came in. Meanwhile, our pint-sized Prodigy Omega is channeling her inner reconnaissance expert. She's surveying the facility like a seasoned pro. But here's the heart-wrenching part. When she tells the other kids to cover me, they look at her like she's speaking her tees. Cover you? What does that mean? They ask. And that, my friends, is a gut punch. These kids, once upon a time, would have been more than likely training as a Jedi by now, where they should have known exactly what Omega was going on about. Omega's on a mission to unravel the Imperial Web of Secrets, and she's not about to let a little thing like walls stop her. She escapes through the wall with Clone Force 99's arrival, causing enough chaos to distract the Empire from guarding the vault. Omega's presented with a golden window of opportunity. Now let's talk about Lazy Rampart for a moment. He's chilling in the forest, probably contemplating if he would have been better off staying in the Imperial Slammer until he realizes that's no rock he's resting upon. It's a Dryax, a hulking humanoid shaped predator straight out of a nightmare holovid. Remember when Omega and Crosshair faced one back in episode 3? Yeah, those were simpler times for sure. The jungle's alive and it's got teeth sharper than a Sith's whip. While Clone Force 99 are battle-hardened soldiers, Rampart's as clueless as a protocol droid at a dance-off. 
He's used to pushing buttons, not dodging giant monsters. And here's where we see a dose of poetic justice. As the Dryax's attention turns towards the Imperial troopers, we're reminded how the Empire's always trying to play Mother Nature's copycat. Space stations shaped like moons, tanks mimicking giant animals. They're like the galaxy's worst art forgers. And now they're dabbling in the dark arts, trying to harness the force itself. But in Tantis, it's not just unnatural, it's downright vile. They're kidnapping kids to do their twisted experiments, so it kind of feels right that nature strikes back itself here. It's like the universe's way of saying, hey Empire, you mess with nature, nature messes back. Dr. Scalder and her trusty medical droid walks into the vault and guess what, Omega's not back yet. But the kids follow through with watching Omega's back and try and distract her. Now, Omega's climbing through the walls and what does she spot? None other than a Zillow Beast, the same colossal creature that Clone Force 99 tangled with back in Season 2 Episode 11. Palpatine, ever the collector of rare and dangerous things, had his eyes on this beast. Why? Because he's got a thing for cloning, and the Zillow Beast's armor is one of the toughest around. The Empire zapping the Zillow Beast as electricity increases the rate in which they grow. Their plan is to simply grow it, kill it, and strip it for its armor, likely for their elite stormtroopers, and then, you guessed it, they'll clone the beast and start the whole process over again. It's like a twisted cycle of cruelty. Hemlock, the Imperial bigwig, probably thinks this monster is about as controllable as a herd of banthers on a caffeine binge, meaning no threat to themselves. But maybe, just maybe, there's a way to communicate with this beast using the Force. Omega and the Force-sensitive Vault children might need to channel their inner Yoda and meditate their way to a Zillow Beast chat session. Ventress would be proud. Before Scouter can put two and two together, Omega slips back into the scene like a stealthy nerf herder. Meanwhile, Emery catches Echo red-handed, well, cybernetic-handed, accessing the console. She's no fool. Omega's been chatting about her brothers and Echo's compliment for a hand is a dead giveaway. But Emery's not about to stop him. In fact, she's probably relieved to see him. After all, she didn't sign up for kid prison duty anyway. Nala Say pulled the escape card and now she's locked up like a malfunctioning droid. Echo, though, reminds us of his original mission. It's not just about Omega. It's about all the prisoners who have been guinea pigs in the Empire's twisted experiments. Remember when he and Rex set off on a rescue mission at the end of last season? Yeah, good times. Emery tries to wiggle out of accountability, but Echo's having none of it, and just like that, Emery switches sides faster than a hyperdrive jump. The show closes with Omega gathering the troops. She's found something big, likely meaning the Zillow Beast holds the key to their escape. Overall, I thought this was a very solid episode, very fast-paced and exciting. However, it still leaves a ton to wrap up in the season final, and I'm a little bit concerned they won't have enough time to do the show justice, so hopefully we're given a double-length episode rather than a standard 20-odd minute. In terms of where the story is right now, we know the Empire won't stop in their pursuit of Omega, for as long as they think she's alive at least, which could also be an element of the Bad Batch we see carried over into the next Star Wars animated show, perhaps one featuring Omega and Ventress together. With the way the show's shaping out, I wouldn't be too surprised if Mount Tantis was destroyed, or at least partially destroyed next week, severely impacting Project Necromancer, which in my opinion needs to delay of some kind to make sense, as they seem too close to the finish line here for Palpatine's clone not to appear for another two decades. That could also explain why Necromancer was was relocated to Exegol as well. Rampart's been a particularly interesting one this episode. He was captured by the Empire, although unintentionally. However, I think he'll grab any opportunity afforded to him to regain a place in the Empire and betray the Batch. Now, I'm not too sure how, as I already know the squad's on Wayland as we speak, but I'm sure the Empire will think of summon. It's also interesting how he questioned Crosshair's loyalty to the Bad Batch as well. Does he know something we don't? Did the Clone X program actually have some kind of effect on him that's not been spoken about? Are the Empire waiting for the right time to activate him and bring him into service? We could be on the cusp of a very rememberable Star Wars episode with the Bad Batch season final. I'm looking forward to seeing how it all plays out. What big reveals do you think away us? Drop your thoughts and theories down in the comments below. Leave a like on the video if you enjoy it. Of course, subscribe to the channel if you want to catch more. I'll catch you in the next one. May the Force be with you.